Hello, my name is Peter Parford and welcome to the New Brit Workshop. My wife asked me if I'd make her a new bookend, you know, so keep books tidy on a bookshelf, to go at one end of the books that she has in her sewing room. So, I thought, well, okay, I'll have a go at it. And this is what I've come up with. It's a bookend, and this isn't a real book, it's made of wood, and neither is that a, a book either. Um, but it's quite heavy, it's got a big lump of metal inside, and I think it'll do just the job. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I made it. Now, before I go any further, let me just explain how this is made. Uh, the first component to draw your attention to is this rectangular section here, made of this wood. Now, I can't remember what this wood is, and I, I'm sure that many of you will spot it straight away. Um, but I've had it for years and years, never done anything with it. But uh, anyway, so there we go. So there and there, mitre joint here, and I've reinforced the mitre joint with splines. And I'll show you how to do this. And I am making a separate video about how I made my little sliding uh, sled to do splines. That's another thing altogether. Now, this book here, great yarns it's supposed to be. <laughs> the R and the N have run into each other, looks like yams. Um, but ages ago, I made up some sections of walnut covered in a maple uh, veneer. And I had some little bits left over, so I cut some strips of that, uh, mitered it, uh, put a block of wood underneath to create uh, that there. And I've sanded off the edges uh, to bring the walnut out from underneath, uh, just to make it a little bit more interesting. Now, the main book itself, I started, and my video will start with this, by making some very thin slices of mahogany. And they are at the sides here and at the front. And the reason I needed really thin slices were two things. First of all, I wanted to do some engraving here and to fill it, as you can see. This actually isn't one of my proudest bits of work, but it doesn't matter. Um, but my CNC is only a 2.5D CNC, so it can't go like this when it does its engraving. It can only do it like so. So I engraved that with this wood flat, and then I bent it in order to allow the, uh, the appearance of it being part of a book. And so that was that feature why I needed thin mahogany. And the other bits of thin mahogany are at the two sides, and these uh, stick up above, as you might expect, a real book, and also they stick out from the back. And so um, you'll see me making that, and I, and I made a, a special gadget up for my planing machine, which allows me to plane really thin bits. It's quite dangerous, and you'll see that I'm wearing a lot of protection when I do it. Now inside this is an old counterweight, a big piece of metal, and I've got a frame in there which helps everything get glued together, and uh, the so-called <laughs> appearance of the page of the book are just some pieces of oak, which is slightly lighter than mahogany, to give that appearance. And, and these are stuck into the right angular section of this wood here, uh, and there are no screws anywhere in the whole thing. And that's it. And it's as I will show you, it's finished off uh, with just one coat of Osmo. I was going to do a second coat, but I quite like this slightly dull appearance for this particular object. So I've got my piece of thin stock. It's 2.4 millimeters thick, and this piece is uh, just over 120 uh, by 55 millimeters. I'm now going to take it to the CNC, do the lettering. All right, I've just used double-sided tape to stick my a uh, little piece of uh, wood in place. Anyway, so that's all ready. 60 degree V cutter. There we go. Now, I hope that's easy to see. So it's made quite a good job. Now, what I don't know is whether I can get this to, to bend, but we'll see. Now, this is the piece of wood that I'm going to use as my backing piece for this. Now what I've got to do is I've got to put a curve on here so that this can be bent into a curved shape which will make it appear more realistically like the end of a book. And uh, that's the part I'm going to do now. 
And when that's done, I'll then slice that piece off and then start making the rest of the container for the weight. So, so I've made this little template. And my idea is that I'll keep checking this as I go. And uh, as I said, I've never done this before. So I'm going to do it as carefully as I can, really. Believe it or not, it's fairly close. So I'm now going to try sanding it to get it uh, even closer. Now, I'm not sure whether I can bend this this little bit and get it to stick on without steaming it. I don't have a steamer. There's a fair bit of tension across there as I try and get that down. Well, this may or may not work. Now, I know these first couple of bits of tape aren't holding it absolutely down, but my idea is that I'm going to tighten them up with subsequent pieces of tape. Well, it's the moment of truth now. This is going to be interesting. Let's try and get all this tape off. It might be difficult to see it, but it's worked. So that is a nice curved surface now. There's one thing I regret that I didn't do at this stage, which is this is the top. And I want the what will be the, the binding of the book and its cover to stick out slightly above uh, what is represented by the, uh, the sort of pages. So maybe I should have finished this piece of wood just below that edge there. But anyway, I think I can overcome that. Right, I'm now going to trim this off for, for length here uh, and also at the bottom. And after that, I'm going to do this very careful cut to leave this little top bit relieved just like the outer cover of a book would be. And now I'm going to set up to do a cut which stops short of this front face here and then allows me to make that front bit look like the edge of the book. Now I've got this piece of MDF against my fence here to bring this forward just by the right amount. I've already set my depth stop and I'm holding the saw in place now so when I do go down now it's going to only cut in one place. Now you may be able to see my first effort here. I'm just a dash short. I was being cautious. I'll go a little bit deeper. And I think that's as close as I'm going to risk for now. I can uh, finish this off a little bit with some sandpaper. Now I'm going to mix up some white epoxy filler that I've got. I've used uh, this before. Uh, I've also got black and you may have seen me use that as well. Um, I had to put a tiny bit of wood filler on here because I had a crack running down there. And I'm just hoping that it's not going to ruin um, the, the lettering. But um, anyway, this white filler is really good stuff. Uh, you need to wear gloves when mixing it. In order to mix this really well, or all like that, fold it over. And it gets softer and more malleable the more you mix it. I think that's probably because of the warmth from my hands. I'm not sure. So I'm now going to put this into all of the writing and my lines. Now, even though the capex and my sanders are really good with dust collection, I'm taking no chances. I'm I really don't uh, like these exotic woods particularly because the dust could be very irritant. So I've got my uh, respirator on. And notice the arrangements I've got for holding this small piece of wood in place. I've made sure it's back against the fence. I've got this, uh, what I call a hold down here. It's quite tight. I've got my thumb underneath here so I can feel the edge of the uh, exotic wood. So 
that's those two mitre cuts done. So that's in a straight line. I'm now going to put some tape across here. And I'm now just going to put some glue down into the joint. Now with some of these exotic woods, um, it's an idea, particularly things like teak, which are very oily wood, to, um, before you put the glue in, is to use some methylated spirits or denatured alcohol to take away any grease. The only trouble I find is you've got to then wait for it to completely evaporate. And uh, I don't think it makes a huge amount of difference. Anyway, there we go. And I just bring this together now. And that's that joint brought together. It's going to have a nice clean edge there. And my gadget, which I've made up, which will help me do the spline joints in a minute, I'm going to just push this down into here. And whilst that glue goes off, I can put that piece there and put a weight on top. And that will then go off nicely. Well, we've got a sort of moment of truth now. I'm going to uh, sand off the, the white stuff. Uh, well, it's, it's not too bad. If I were a professional doing this for a client, I would not accept this um, as something which I could uh, have my signature on. Uh, but I think that will do. By the time I've put some Osmo on there, that will be <laughs> as good as I can do. <laughs> and I need to cut a, a channel in this piece in order to allow my weight uh, to come forward a little bit. So I've set the writer up. It's going to have to be three passes, one through the middle and then two at each side. Now I'm feeding my work through from this side going that way. Now it's important now to know how to set the writer table up for the next cut. If we were doing this by hand and it was this way up, we would be cutting off this side with the writer coming towards us that way. That's the direction the writer comes towards us. So the workpiece direction is that way. So that's the workpiece direction if the writer is fixed. So if I now turn this upside down, you can see that if it's going in this direction, we need to be cutting off this side. So therefore, when I now set up for my cut, I'm going to set it so it's cutting over, over here. So I'm moving the fence that way. And that was as it should be. If it were the other way around, this piece would have been going flying off in one direction or the other. So I'm now going to turn it round so I get a symmetrical cut and cut the other side. And there's that channel cut safely. So it's important to remember which side the writer cutter is cutting and which direction you're going in. Really, really important. So this is the stage I'm at now. There's my weight there and there's my front piece with the channel and that's going to sit on here roughly like this and I now need a couple of side pieces one at each side I've cut them to, to size and I'm now going to glue them on if I turn this around you can see now that the weight is contained within this space there'll be a backing piece on here and they're then going to have some side pieces put on which will protrude at the front here and be rounded over to give that impression of part of the, uh, the book binding, the book cover, which uh, is normally creased at the edge. And that's that uh, glued up ready uh, to sort of dry. I've been very careful not to squeeze too tight here. I don't want to really damage the look of the front. I want to put some splines in this just to strengthen it a little bit. And I've never done any splines across a mitre joint before so this is the first time and I thought it was a, a, a good time to practice uh, with my newly created mitre spline box and the idea is this will be acting like a sled uh, on the table saw and I'll have my piece of work in here like so and I then move it across and the saw blade is cutting a spline across 
that mitre joint. I hope this shows up enough, but I put some pencil marks here at uh, 10 millimeter intervals from the, uh, measured from the middle. Uh, and the idea of that is it gives me a rough guide uh, when I'm about to do a cut, uh, roughly where to place things. So what I'm gonna do first of all is I'm gonna do a cut at either extremity. Now in order to make this safe, I'm gonna hold it like this. So that's in there, nice and firm. Turn the saw on. And I hope you can see there's one cut there and it did not go all the way through. So I've done one there. Now I could now reverse this like so. And that'll put a cut at the other side symmetrically. So we've now got two cuts. I'd like to put two more. I'm just gonna make a judgment now where they should be. Now there's method to my madness. When I was cutting out those thin, thin bits of mahogany in order to make the place where the lettering goes, which I can bend round, um, I made it so that the thickness there is the same as the kerf on my saw. So this offcut I can use in these joints. Now I've cut two short pieces of that leftover bit of mahogany and I need to cut this in half now, both pieces at the same time. And there's absolutely no way you're going to get your fingers close uh, to a saw cut like this. So a long time ago I made this gadget. It's got a thin piece of oak going up here and there's a handle here so that I can exert pressure, spring loaded here, my fingers are well out of the way. So it's in the right place. And I hope you can see now, I'm gonna be putting four pieces across like this. I'll trim them afterwards. So I've got to make sure they, they go in fairly centrally. So that's those four splines in now, and I'll trim those afterwards. I'm just gonna leave that to dry. So my glue's gone off now, so I'm gonna use my flush cut um, a little trimming saw uh, to cut these off. Now it's really important, if you've got grain going that way, and it's in this situation, if I were cutting upwards like this, and I was putting a bit of pressure in, in the wrong way uh, on these pieces, the piece could split. If I was starting at the bottom, the split could go through the actual piece. But if I start at the top, then it's less likely to happen because any pressure will just cause the piece to break away from the joint rather than break into the joint. Now when you're using a saw like this it's not easy but you've got to keep the pressure with your finger here on the saw to keep it flat against the, the surface. There that is. And you can see because there's no set on this saw that I've not damaged that face at all. So I'm just going to continue this for the others. Right, well this main piece is nearly finished and so what I'm going to do is on each side I'm going to have a piece of thin mahogany which has been rounded on this front edge just a bit and it will stick out just a tiny bit from the front and uh, this piece isn't quite wide enough, so I've got a joining piece. Uh, and there'll be a similar effect at the back where it goes beyond what would have been the pages of the book. So I'm just going to do these and then get them glued on. Now just for a bit of added interest, I've made another little book that goes on the end here. Now years ago I, I made something using walnut which had been veneered on the outside with some maple. I've sanded off the edges to reveal the walnut um, and I've engraved, um, supposed to say great yarns, but unfortunately, because I went a little bit deeper than I perhaps I should have done uh, with the engraving, it looks like great yams, but never mind, it's not a rude word, at least not as far as I know. But I'm just putting a, a coat of Osmo on, on this. I've, I've done this part, uh, this is gonna be joined onto it, but I wanna get a first coat on this. Then when I've assembled it, uh, I'll give a, a second coat and that'll be the job done. I'm using the 3011 Osmo PolyX Gloss and I'm putting it on with a, a small brush uh, and in the flat fieldy bits I'm using a little white scourer 
and then I'm wiping off with some of my workshop cloth. I'm standing this on a, a piece of parchment paper, uh, or greaseproof paper, I think it's probably called. I'm just going to wipe off the excess with a piece of my workshop cloth. That's where an area where I'll be using glue to keep this fixed on. And I'm just going to leave that uh, to dry thoroughly. Well, that's it. It's now finished and um, it's not too bad. But there are one or two things I'll do slightly differently next time. Let me just explain those now. First of all, when I bent this piece of mahogany at the front uh, in order to keep the lettering right, um, I opened up the grain a bit. And what I should have done, and I really, really miss, miss this point, what I should have done, and I really should have got this right, was to have filled the grain before I then used the white stuff on here uh, to fill in the lettering. Because what's now happened is that when I sanded this down to expose the white lettering, I was having to sand a bit more than I really wanted to in order to try and get rid of the white stuff that's stuck in the grain. And there are some letters which have disappeared as a result here. And uh, is just there by a garment. I think the T is missing. And uh, hemming press, the G is missing there. So uh, that, that's a lesson learned there. I'm quite pleased with my new splining gadget and I'm making a separate video on that. I think it's probably close enough for government work. If I were to make another one, it would be much better, of course. Well, I hope this video has been useful and thank you very much for getting to the bitter end. A lot of people have asked if they can help me by donating via Patreon or uh, looking after me by sending something to PayPal uh, or whatever. Well, I don't do any of that. It would really break my heart if someone gave a donation to me who was less well off than me. That would really upset me. However, there is a way you could help. I've written a book. It's a mystery thriller with a dash of sci-fi, and it's about time travel. And it's available as a Kindle edition from Amazon. And I'll put the links in the description for this video. And it's called Stone Message. So if you want to help me, buy a copy of that. Maybe read it and you know, give a review. Many thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>